Welcome to Ambassador Radio. In this episode, we'll be going through chapter one of John Owen and his great Puritan paperback, The Glory of Christ. Chapter one is on seeing Christ's glory. I hope you enjoy it. All right, so The Glory of Christ by John Owen. Um, if you just look at, at the table of contents, um, you're, you're going to see we're going to try to cover one chapter each time we meet. I don't know how often we'll get to meet. Usually it's a couple times a month. Usually it's up at Randall's and Churchill. Um, but I, I wanted to meet here at church for the first time. That's what we did the last book. We started it out here at church just to maybe encourage some folks in the community down here to join us. Um, but anyway, it's a Banner of Truth book, John Owen. And it's funny, at the conference a couple weeks ago when Mike was referencing this book, he was talking about what's the first John Owen book everybody reads? And everybody says The Mortification of Sin. He said, yeah, that's a good book. He said, but why is the first book that everybody reads not The Glory of Christ? And this was, I think I read the last book that Owen wrote before he died. So this was near the end of his ministry. But man, I've only read so far seven chapters in it, and it is thick. Normally when we do these, I'll underline a few things that I think are interesting. Oh, here's your bookmark if you want to, or, and uh, here's your bookmark too. But, um, you know, a lot of these books we go through, you know, I'll underline two or three things on a page, and we'll kind of discuss it and extrapolate it, but going through this there's there's so much i was like i'm like underlining almost everything i had to refrain from underlining stuff because i'm like okay we can't spend three hours talking about a chapter i mean i guess we could but nonetheless um but we'll go ahead and jump to page one chapter one seeing christ's glory And as I said, I kept underlining everything. Uh, My note here says to read the whole page. (laughs) So let's start out. We'll just read the whole page. It says, When the high priest under the law was about to enter the holy place on the day of atonement, he took in his hands sweet incense from the golden table of incense. He also had a censer filled with fire taken from the altar of burnt offerings where atonement was made for sin with blood. When he actually entered through the veil, he put the incense on the fire in the censer until the cloud of its smoke covered the ark. And the mercy seat, it's talking about Leviticus chapter 16, the reason why he did this was to present to God on behalf of the people a sweet smell from the sacrifice of propitiation. So that first paragraph, we'll we'll keep reading. This was a picture in the Old Testament of Christ being the substitute. Christ being that sacrificial lamb, that blood, and what? He was our propitiation. In the Old Testament, these pictures, these fuzzy pictures, we see the blood of the lamb, the blood of the bull. But That was all pointing forward to Christ and the glory of Christ. The smoke, this cloud of smoke, what's that a picture of? Well, think about the pillar of fire by night and the pillar of smoke by day. What was it? That was the glory of Christ protecting the Israelites, going with them. Here, as the blood was um, put on the, uh, the ark, And as the censer, the incense, the smoke filled the holy place. And what? It was a picture of the glory of Christ. Let's keep going. We'll keep reading the whole rest of the page. Corresponding. You following along, son? All right. Second paragraph says, Corresponding to this mystical type, the great high priest of the church, our Lord Jesus Christ, prayed 
when he was about to enter the holy place, not made with hands. That's John chapter 17. His glorious prayer, set alight by the blood of his sacrifice, filled the heavens above, the glorious place of God's residence, with a cloud of incense. That is, the sweet smell of his blessed in intercession by the same eternal fire by which he offered himself a bloody sacrifice to make atonement for sin. He kindled in his most holy soul those desires that all of the benefits of his sacrifice should be given abundantly to his church. That last sentence, all the benefits of his sacrifice. It's not just, well, we get a little bit of justification from Christ and then the rest is up to us to maintain it. No, we get all the benefits of the sacrifice. We are made righteous in the eyes of the Father based on the sacrifice of the Son. And we are progressively made holy. It's that idea of the duplex gratia, right? The Christ for pardon, Christ for power. Christ for pardon, justification. We are granted his righteous standing based on his work, his work alone. We're born again. We trust Christ alone. And then the Christ for power is the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, conforming us to the image of the Son. But it is given abundantly to his church as Christ was, is preparing a place for us where we will go one day, those who have trusted in him. It says he was about to enter the place not made with hands. That Old Testament, that Levitical system, it was just pointing to the glory of Christ. It was pointing to who he is, pointing to what he would accomplish. Page two, we won't read the entire page now, but we'll look at it. The great desire that Christ expressed in his prayer was that his people might be with him to behold his glory. That's John chapter 17. To behold his glory. His own glory, it says. So while Jesus was on the earth, there were a few little tastes of his true glory, but it was veiled, right? It was veiled. It was veiled in humanity. He didn't look any different than you or me, right? That was the thing. It was veiled. It was hidden. His glory, his true glory as the second member of the Godhead was veiled. And this whole, so many times it's easy to get ahead of ourselves in this book, and I'm going to try not to get ahead of myself because each chapter, it just fleshes out so much. So I'm going to try not to jump ahead, but I no, no doubt will. But it's his own glory. It's not a glory necessarily that was given to him. Remember, he said, glorify me, Father, with the glory that I have with you, what? Before the world was. It is his glory because he is God. But there's also a glory that he gets because in his humanity that he has perfectly obeyed and died substitutionarily. So he has an, this innate glory of him being God. He has this glory that is bestowed upon him in his humanity because of what he has done. The beholding of his glory, we're on page two still, the beholding of his glory might bring encouragement, strength, satisfaction, and blessedness to his disciples. What did he say? He said, I want you to witness my glory. I want you to see my glory. This will be your satisfaction. When we were in the Thomas Brooks book, it was all based around, um, I already forgot. What was the verse? Oh, Lamentations 3.24. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. When Christ is our portion. And I'll tell you, I used just the table of contents to that book as a sermon illustration one time when I was preaching here. Because just reading the table of contents was so encouraging, so reassuring. Um, that Art for All God's Noah's book. But to behold the glory of God, 
means that you're satisfied totally in him, in Christ. It's the blessedness of his disciples. He wanted them to see that. Keep moving down page two. Only a sight of his glory and nothing else will truly satisfy God's people. God's people, those whom the Father chose, whom the Son redeemed, and who the Spirit applied that redemption. Those are God's people. Nothing will satisfy us except Christ himself. And so many times we try to fulfill with different things. We come to church on Sunday. We sing to him. We pray corporately. We gather. We listen to a sermon. We give. But what happens? We're still not completely satisfied because this is just a picture of what's going to happen when we get to heaven, right? And so many times we will try to pacify ourselves with other things, even as Christians. You know, we, we can say that the lost people do that. We can say the lost world will pacify themselves with drugs or with pornography or with alcohol or whatever it is just money you know those things we can say the lost world but even inside the christian church we try to pacify ourselves so often with things of this world now i'm not saying the things of this world are bad chicken minis and and uh, cheddar rounds are wonderful things of this world right they are great gifts from God. We can enjoy the things of this world. We can enjoy a Coca-Cola. We can enjoy, you know, writing with ink pens. You know, it's just something I'm looking at here. Those are things of this world that are wonderful. But what happens is when we try to, instead of using and enjoying those things, we will sometimes try to turn those things into idols, into things that we're obsessed with. I, I like baseball. I enjoy watching baseball. I enjoy the conversations that my son and I can have with baseball. But it's not the most important thing. It is a wonderful gift from God, a tool that God uh, has given us to enjoy each other's company. But it's not the most important thing. If the pen isn't working, you can try another pen. Yeah. If, oh, it's working. Okay, good. Um, but to the Christian... True satisfaction is only in Christ himself, to see the glory of God. It says a believer will always be restless until he or she comes to Christ and beholds his glory, right? We are restless. We're antsy in this place. Sometimes we can, we can have good motives for wanting to learn more about Christ. We, we're so jealous for his glory, right? Jealousy is not always a sin in humans. We can be jealous for the glory of God that we can have theological arguments with people saying, you're not glorifying him enough. Well, guess what? I'm not glorifying him enough either, right? We do that. Different theological camps will say, you're robbing God of his glory, right? Well, I'm robbing him of his glory too. If I'm trying to say my better, my superior theology, right, is, is why I understand these, then I've missed the boat. No, it's the glory of God. It's the grace of God that he has given me this ability to understand. And we'll all, when we get to glory and we see him face to face, what are we going to do? We're like, man, my theology was terrible when I was on earth. <laughs> Every one of us. Well, our goal is to improve our theology, but we're gonna be, we're like, man, praise God for His grace. We're not saved by how perfect our theology is, right? We're saved by the grace of God, grace through faith. So only a sight of His glory and nothing else will truly satisfy God's people. A believer will always be restless until he or she comes to Christ and beholds his glory. Let's keep moving. One of the greatest privileges the believer has, both in this world and for eternity, is to behold the glory of Christ. 
we can see. That's why this book is called The Glory of Christ. To behold who he is, what he has done, his character, his nature, his works, but just who he is. We praise him so often for what he's done, and as well we should. But sometimes we can forget about praising him for just who he is, right? We're like, oh, yeah, he died for our sins. He lived a perfect life and credits that to our account by faith alone. And those are that's very, very important stuff. But it's, we don't want to divorce that from the person, from who he is, that he is God. He has every right to just send us all straight to hell, right? Right, son? Uh-huh. <laughs> but he's shown his grace. He's shown his mercy. One of the greatest privileges a believer has in this world and for eternity. Cause the, and that's the thing. It's in this world, at the bottom of page two, in this world, we have this veiled view, this foggy view of the glory of Christ. We think we get it. We think we understand it. But man, when we get to heaven and we see it with perfected eyes and we experience it with perfected senses, how wonderful will that be? How wonderful to experience worship not tainted by a flesh that has been so affected by sin, right? Because we can go to church, we can see our own sin, we can experience our own sin on the drive to church that morning. Um, we experience it the night before. We're getting ready to go to bed. We experience it when we get out of here. We experience our sin here. We are seeking the glory of Christ. And there are times in this earth when we may feel like we have experienced it but it will be nothing like when we get to glory. Let's keep going. Page three. I don't know. How, how long is this first chapter? Okay. Yeah, it goes to page 10. So we'll, we'll wrap this up here. We'll do one chapter today. I was wondering when I was reading this thing, I'm like, we might only do half a chapter each, each session we meet, but I guess we're not really bound by time. If anybody's got to, I mean, if you got to go, you got to go. But... You know, if we spend a couple hours or if we spend an hour, whatever, it's fun. All right, page three, the glory of Christ. So it says, unbelievers see no glory in Christ. It says what? They despise him. We can think of an atheist. Yeah, an atheist would openly say, I despise Jesus, wouldn't they? We can look at... Um, an agnostic, and they'll say, well, I don't even know if he really existed. And to say, I don't know if you exist, that is despising you, right? What would be worse, for me to just be indifferent about you or to say, I don't even know if you exist, Gentry, you know? To say, I don't even know if you exist, is a bigger insult than to say you exist and I'm just not really paying attention to you. But imagine if you are the God of the universe and somebody says, I don't even know if you exist. Well, they're liars. They do know God exists. They may not know details about Jesus Christ. They may not know details about his work and his person. They may not, they definitely don't believe it. But if they say that he doesn't exist, they're being dishonest. But think about other types of unbelievers. Other types of unbelievers will, will give lip service to Jesus. There are people in sound churches every single week who are just giving lip service to Jesus. They don't really trust him. They're just going because maybe a family member guilts them into going. Maybe they think it's socially advantageous to be a member of this church for business reasons. Whatever. Or maybe they fooled themselves. But they don't even know who Jesus is. They see no glory in Christ as an unbeliever because they've twisted who he is. They may not be trusting in him. They may not think he's worthy to be trusted in. 
Think of some of the cults. Islam. They give lip service to Jesus, right? Well, what's worse to say, as an atheist would say, I don't believe in him? Or as a Muslim to say, yes, I believe in Jesus. Yes, I think he's very, very important. But nope, I don't think he's God. So it would be like me saying, yes, Gentry, you're very important to me. But I don't think you're really Gentry. I think you're your sister, J.C., or I think you're uh, the dog, Cash. Like, that is more akin to the insult that Islam puts on Jesus to say, mm, I believe in you, I like you, I think you're important, but you're not who you said you were. That's a bigger insult than the, than the, the, the atheist saying, I don't believe you even exist, is to say, yes, I believe in you, but... You're not who you say you are. Same thing. The, the Mormons, the Jehovah's Witnesses, Roman Catholicism even, they get a lot of the doctrine of God and Christology right. right. I mean, Protestants and Roman Catholics, we share early church history. Those first 500 years of church history or so, we can both, Roman Catholics, Eastern Orthodox, and, uh, and Protestants can point to that, and we will find people who agree with each of our doctrines, right? But obviously, as a Protestant, we look at the Scriptures, and the Scriptures overwhelmingly are clear regarding soteriology. But we agree, Roman Catholics and Protestants agree on who Christ is. Things like the Nicene Creed, those are documents that Roman Catholics will point to and Protestants will point to. The Athanasian Creed, um, so many of the early creeds, Protestants and Catholics, and when it's talking about who God is, we agree. We disagree on soteriology, how someone is saved, right? Then those are very important things. We disagree on ecclesiology, the doctrine of the church. Those are very important things. We definitely disagree on the magisterium, right? We don't believe there is an office of a pope. But we can look at God. Rome affirms a trinity. Uh, Eastern Orthodox, they affirm the trinity. Um, they believe in the deity of Christ. We believe in the deity of Christ. But going back to the other groups, the, the Jehovah's Witness des denies the deity of Christ. The Mormon, deity of Christ, no big deal then. We'll all be gods, right? So to know who he is, to behold his glory, the unbeliever, no matter how much he claims he loves Jesus, hates him, despises Christ in who he is. Well, I mean, think about the Pharisees. What did the Pharisees do? They loved the idea of a Messiah, but when they actually met him, they despised him. Why? Because he wasn't who they wanted him to be. And that's many people today with Christ. They twist who he is. Look at liberal Christianity. He's just an example. He's not a substitute. Well, a Christ who is just an example is not worthy to be worshipped. He's just an exalted man. But the Christ who is the substitute, he is the one worthy to be worshipped. Let's keep going. Hey, we're still on page three. In the early days of the church, there were swarms of brain sick persons who vomited out many foolish ideas culminating at length in Arianism. Well, Arianism, what is the modern day Arian? The Jehovah's Witness, right? They deny that Jesus is God. They deny the Trinity. They just think he's an exalted man. That's Jehovah's Witnesses today. Keep moving on down. Unbelief in the Trinity and the incarnation of the Son of God, the sole foundation of Christianity. I'll read that again. The sole foundation of Christianity. It's not the church, right? It's not in what we 
think. It's in who Christ is and what he has done. It's in the deity of Christ and the humanity of Christ being united forever. The unbelief in the Trinity and the incarnation of the Son of God, the sole foundation of Christianity, is so spread about in the world that it has almost demolished the life and power of true Christianity. And not a few who dare not let people know what they really believe led people or lead people to think they love Jesus when all the time they scorn, despise, and persecute those who truly desire to know nothing but Christ in him crucified. crucified. Unbelief, disbelief. I don't know if I said belief in the Trinity earlier or if I said disbelief or unbelief, but it is unbelief in the Trinity. To deny the Trinity is to deny who Christ is. To deny that he was born of a virgin is to deny who Christ is. To to deny that he is truly God and truly man is to deny who Christ is. To deny that he rose on the third day is to deny who Christ is. If I tell you a whole story, I'm going to say this is all about my son Gentry. And if I say, well, he was born in 2006 and he was our firstborn child, and he was named after my great-grandfather, or after my grandfather, and he's a girl, and we named him J.C. Well, I'm going to tell you a story. I'm going to say it's all about him, but it's not. It's about someone totally different. It's about our daughter. Everything I just said is about our daughter. Well, that's what happens when people deny the Trinity. They may be telling you that this God they worship is Jesus, this person that they're exalting is Jesus, but it's really not. They're telling you all about somebody else. And that's exactly what I was trying to make clear. Gentry looked at me real funny when I said he was born in 2006 because he's like, oh, where are you going? What are you talking about, Dad? No, that's the point. I was describing everything about your sister but I was saying attributing it to you that's not going to be honoring to him and it's definitely not honoring to Christ when we do that when people do that to lose Christ as the God man to lose him as the second member of the Trinity is to lose all of Christianity it is the duty of all those who love the Lord. We're at the very bottom of page three. It is the duty of all of those who love the Lord, Jesus, in sincerity to testify to his divine person and glory according to the ability God has given each of us. What do we do? We're ambassadors for Christ. This group is called what? Ambassador Evangelism. We are proclaiming the evangel, the gospel, the good news as ambassadors for Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.20. What's it say, son? Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. That is us. Just representing our king, proclaiming his truth to the world. I was having a discussion with somebody. They were asking about discipleship and evangelism. And obviously this is an oversimplification, but what's the difference? The only difference is the audience. I mean, there's different levels of depth, obviously, but it's teaching people about Christ and his gospel. Discipleship, you're assuming that person is a Christian. Evangelism, you're assuming that person is not a Christian. But it's still teaching people about Christ and his work. Christ and his gospel. So every bit of discipleship may very well be evangelism. If you don't know the soul uh, situation of that person you're teaching, who knows? We don't know if they're a Christian or not. We know what we may think. We know what they uh, profess, but we don't really know. So what we think is evangelism, 
if they're a Christian, it's really discipleship. What we think is discipleship, if they're not a Christian, may very well be evangelism. And that's right here. It is to testify. That's what the bottom of page 3, top of page 4 is saying. The duty of all those who love the Lord Jesus in sincerity to testify to his divine person and glory according to the ability God has given each of us. Whether it's someone who is gifted in sharing the gospel, doing it to thousands, or whether it's a brother telling his sister the gospel. Whether it's a, a sweet grandmother teaching her three-year-old granddaughter the gospel, it's according to our abilities that he has allowed us to do, our giftings that he has given us, and according to our opportunities. So, to proclaim the good news. All right, let's keep going. Beholding the glory of Christ is one of the greatest privileges that believers are capable of in this world. It is by beholding the glory of Christ that believers are first gradually transformed into his image and then brought into the eternal enjoyment of it. All right, so gradually transformed. Are we talking about justification or are we talking about sanctification? Well, if it, the word gradually transformed, that shows us it's talking about sanctification gradually, slowly transforming us into the image of the Son. Justification is instantaneous. It is us being credited, transformed, made a new creature, trusting in Christ alone. But the gradual transformation is that of sanctification. And how does he do it? He does it through his word, through the singing of his word, through the preaching of his word, through prayer, through communion, taking the Lord's Supper, through baptism. He does, these are all sermons. Every one of those things is a sermon. Every song we sing on Sunday is a sermon. Every time we take the Lord's Supper, that is God preaching through the elements. Every time we see a baptism, that is God preaching through that baptism to us. And of course, the sermon is preaching to us too, right? Every time. And that is so that we will behold the glory of Christ. <clears throat> Scripture shows us two ways to behold the glory of Christ. By faith and by sight. Right? What, are, what is our option here today? It's not by sight, right? By sight will only be when we get to the next world, right? When we get to our heavenly home. Now we behold the glory of Christ by faith alone. No man, this is bottom of page four, bottom of page four. No man shall ever behold the glory of Christ by sight who does not, in some measure, behold it by faith. What's that mean? If you didn't trust Christ here, you surely won't be worshiping him there. If you're not looking to him by faith here, you won't see him by sight there. <clears throat> page five, middle of page five. We beheld his glory. This is John chapter one. We beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John chapter one, verse 14. How do we behold his glory? Here by faith, there by sight. What the apostles witnessed, bottom of page five, was the glory of grace and truth. How did they see this glory? It was by faith and in no other way. For the privilege was given only to those who received him and believed on his name. That's John chapter one. By faith, by faith, by faith, by faith. Page six. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Who said that? John the Baptist, right? That's John chapter 1, verse 29. There's a guy I know uh, on Twitter, lives in southwest Virginia. Every single day he posts that Bible verse. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John chapter 1, 29. And I'm encouraged every time I read it. It, it would be wonderful for us to read that verse every day. And I want to 
Thank God for him posting that verse every single day because it's a reminder. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He that has no sign of Christ's glory here shall never see it hereafter. The beholding of Christ in glory is too high, glorious and marvelous for us in our present condition. The splendor of Christ's glory is too much for our physical eyes, just as is the sun shining in all its strength. So while we are here on earth, we can behold his glory only by faith, by trusting him, trusting in him alone. Bottom of page six, a soul will be troubled rather than edified when it thinks of future glory. If it has had no foretaste, sense, experience, or evidence of these things by faith. That is how he grants us everlasting life, right? He transforms us into new creatures regenerating us, giving us the gift of faith. So if we haven't received the gift of faith, we're not going to receive the gift of eternal life, right? It is a package deal. And we shall behold the glory of God here by faith in these fuzzy condition with our eyes having the veil over them a little bit so that we can see it in Full better than 1080p, right? When we get, or 4K. What's the high thing now? They got 8K now? I don't know, but high definition when we get there. It's like we're watching it on a six inch black and white TV now. We may see the most glorious things about Christ in the Word of God, but it's like watching it on a teeny tiny television. It's black and white with rabbit ears that are just, I know you don't know what rabbit ears are, do you? It's an antenna that's not coming in with good signal. So, verse page 7. It is only as we behold the glory of Christ by faith here in this world that our hearts will be drawn more and more to Christ and to the full enjoyment of the sight of his glory hereafter. It is by faith that we grow to love Christ. If we desire strong faith and powerful love, which give us rest, peace, and satisfaction, we must seek them by diligently beholding the glory of Christ by faith. And sometimes that can seem a little bit contradictory to read a sentence like that. So it says, if we desire strong faith and powerful love, which give us rest, peace, and satisfaction, we must seek them by diligently beholding the glory of Christ by faith. So we're going to have to diligently seek them to get rest, peace, and satisfaction. It's like, oh, to receive these things, i got to work really, really, really hard. Well, it's true. We work hard out of gratitude, right? Out of appreciation that he, he has given us by faith, he's given us rest. He's given us peace. He's given us the full satisfaction of him in Christ. And then what? Out of gratitude, we spend the rest of our days seeking those, seeking to know him more, seeking that rest, seeking peace, seeking satisfaction, beholding the glory of Christ by faith alone. On Christ's glory, I would fix all my thoughts and desires. And the more I see of the glory of Christ, the more the painted beauties of this world will wither in my eyes, and I will be more and more crucified to this world. It will become to me like something dead and putrid, impossible for me to enjoy. When the war, things of this world are like going to the dump, right? When we go, we see things that are we used to love, we used to enjoy. I'm like, I don't care about that much anymore. It's not even bad things. It's not even horrible things. I remember when I was a teenager, almost every night of the week, I knew what sitcoms 
came on and what time they came on, and I was making sure I was watching them, right? And really, today, I don't know if I can name a single sitcom that comes on TV. It's not, I mean, and a lot of sitcoms probably are sinful and bad, I don't know, but the point I'm making is, it's not necessarily a bad thing, but in comparison to the glory of Christ, as God has sanctified me through all these years, I don't care as much about those things. I'm not saying they're sinful things. I'm just saying when you compare it to the altogether lovely thing that is Christ, those things are less important. And don't hear me saying that watching TV is bad. I watch TV. But it's not important anymore. It's not it's not appointment viewing. Of course, I guess in today's world, there is no more appointment viewing because you just stream everything, right? But the idea that I used to set my clock around when a TV show came on. And now we order our lives around church service. Hey, it's Sunday. No, we're not going to go do that. Hey, it's Wednesday night. No, we're not going out to eat b- between 6 and 7 because we're going to be at church. You know, we're not going to our friend's house because we'll be at church. And it's, it's not being legalistic in it. It's that Christ is altogether lovely and altogether worthy to be worshipped. By beholding the glory of Christ, we shall be made fit and ready for heaven. That is what sanctification is, isn't it? Justified, I can stand in heaven based on the works of another. Sanctification is God killing our desires for earthly things and growing our desires for heavenly things. There's that old saying, it was a song, I know Johnny Cash recorded it, I don't know who else did, but it was, so heavenly minded you're no earthly good. Well, that is stupid theology. There is no one who is truly earthly good unless they are heavenly minded. Now I get the idea behind the song is, People with a fake heavenly mindedness, right? They have this idea, this this faux piety where they're, well, I'm focused on this, I'm focused on that. That's a faux piety, yeah. Faux piety is evil and self-serving. But to be truly heavenly minded is to be the most earthly good. When we are seeking the glory of God... That is how I can be the most good here on this earth. Page 8. It is to be received only by faith. But fallen man is incapable of believing. A lost man cannot believe. He can't do good things. And believing is a good thing. Uh, Music cannot please a deaf man, nor can beautiful colors impress a blind man. A fish would not thank you for taking it out of the sea and putting it on dry land under the blazing sun. Neither would an unregenerate sinner welcome the thought of living forever in the blazing glory of Christ. The first touches of glory here are communicated to believers by an almighty act of the will and the grace of God. By beholding the glory of Christ, we shall be transformed into the same image. That's 2 Corinthians 3. By beholding the glory of Christ by faith, we shall find rest to our soul. Where the soul is fixed on the glory of Christ, then the mind finds rest and peace. To be spiritually minded is peace. That's Romans 8. By beholding the glory of Christ, we shall begin to experience what it means to be everlastingly blessed. We shall always be with the Lord. We shall be with Christ, which is the best of all. We shall behold his glory. We shall be made like him. This is our everlasting blessedness. God, in his immense essence, is invisible to our physical eyes and will be in eternity just as he will always be incomprehensible to our minds. 
So the sight which we shall have of God will be always in the face of Jesus Christ. In Christ's face we shall see the glory of God in his infinite perfections. These things will shine into our souls, filling us forever with peace, rest, and glory. We can rejoice in these things even though we cannot understand them. That peace of God which passes all understanding keeps our hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. Christ in believers, the hope of glory. We're on page 10. We're almost done here. It gives us a foretaste of the future glory. We see by faith alone now, and we'll see by sight when we meet him there. In the following chapters... This is what Owen says at the end of chapter 1. In the following chapters, we will consider the following questions. What is the glory of Christ which we can behold by faith? How do we behold the glory of Christ by faith? And how is our beholding Christ by faith different from our actually seeing his glory in heaven? Ambassador Radio is a ministry of Bass Chapel Baptist Church in Sir Gornsville, Tennessee. You can find us at BassChapelBaptist.org. Service times are Sunday School, 10 a.m., Lord's Day Worship, 11 a.m., Evening Worship at 6 p.m., and Wednesdays at 6 p.m. We hope to see you there. Mm -hmm.